folks to get uh, into the Zoom. Happy you're here. Uh, can't wait to uh, be in community with you, hear what you're sharing with us tonight. We have an amazing teacher tonight. tonight. Uh, so yes, yeah, so just back for a bit. Uh, we'll allow the to get in.
This is One Mic, One Globe. Um, I am so excited because this is our last One Mic, One Globe for 2020. We've all been through a lot this year and I'm super excited to just celebrate all things of poetry and creative words, creative art um, tonight. Uh, we have a really phenomenal lineup of features and we will also have open mic share opportunities as well. Um, so, uh, as folks kind of tune in, we'll kind of get grounded in space a little bit here. Um, and I look forward to hearing what you have to share tonight. I look forward to hearing the speakers. Um, and I'm so glad to be the team with you on tonight as we continue taking out 2020. Um, LAPS has done a lot uh, of things throughout this uh, year to keep us all connected. I'm super grateful to be here with you all have this opportunity to share. So what I'd like to do is, um, I know we are waiting for other folks to uh, come in. Um, so what I wanna do is just talk a little bit about uh, the mic and kind of bring us into this space together. Um, we have uh, shares coming from all over the country and from all over the world tonight. Um, I'm really humbled that we could do this uh, together. Um, one Mic, One Globe has been a monthly open mic series that started on Earth Day of this year. And um, we've been bringing all different voices to the table to share as features and then enjoying each other's poetry in the open mic sessions. And um, I'm super excited to have um, you all tonight with these features. We have uh, Marcia Peschke, uh, Eros uh, J. De La Torre, the Third, De La Torre the Third, Micah Tasaka, Juan Cardenas, and Kamari Carter Hawkins tonight uh, to share their poetry with us. Um, we will have two sessions of open mic uh, starting around 7.45 to about 8.15 and then from 9 to 9.30 tonight. Um, and again, we can stay on if we want to keep sharing too, if, if, if you all really want to celebrate uh, for a longer session tonight. Um, and so what we can do is, uh, what I like to do before we start um, our moments together is just kind of taking a deep breath, um, acknowledging where we are, and um, just really setting an intention for this time together. So uh, I'll invite you to do is um, just kind of sit in your space, close your eyes, and you know, roll your shoulders around, just kind of get nice and loose and, and really set uh, and present here right now. And as you close your eyes, I want you to take a deep breath together and just exhale. And let's do that again. And as we inhale, I want you to hold the breath a little bit here and just be present in this moment with yourself and this mic and exhale. And I'd like to take one more inhale together. Hold that inhale and let's just acknowledge our presence here in this space, the ancestors who guided us to this space, 
the people of the lands and the spaces we are all coming from together tonight. Let's just acknowledge their energies here and exhale as we welcome all of that energy here tonight. And take a deep inhale and gently exhale and come into the space. And I'm gonna go ahead and just share my intention for our session tonight. Um, this is a poem that I share to start off our, um, our experience together. It's a magical moment every time and I'm super honored to be your host tonight. I'm honored to be a part of the Los Angeles Poet Society and um, to be here with you. And so with every session, the intention is solidarity. And so tonight we join together to feel the dirt grounding us, the water cooling us, the air liberating us, the fire warming our stories as one. We are all one humanity in this one moment together. May these next two hours show us all the love that still exists beyond quarantine walls, all the fights still in us to overcome injustices, all the life in the creative flow still birthing us anew. And all the light we ignite when we stand together as a sea of glowing candles, knowing that if one of us loses flame, then we are all here to relight your candle. We're all showing up in our truest ways. So may we respect the truth of the vulnerability shared here tonight. Let us not breathe hate. There's enough of that in existence already. Let us not silence one another, talk over one another, shame one another. No, that is not this space. This mic is ours. We are a rainbow of voices in this sanctuary, united in artistic delight, guided to come here for shared passions. We are from the dirt, the water, the air, the fire, all of us. And we will honor ourselves tonight. Praise the courage that powers this mic snap our hearts alive for the lines that stir our minds, rumble in the yeses and the ahs for the mastery of this mic. We are a celebration right here. Some of us will surprise us. Some will make us whole again. Some will make us question everything. Some will share our aches. Some will be the remedy we needed all along and couldn't have had without this mic, without this community. And so as you sign up by typing solidarity into the chat box, um, know that you are held now, not just by me or the Los Angeles Poet Society or these powerful features, you are also cradled by this poetic planet, a globe needing you. You are the history we are making tonight right here. May this mic this night be our protest song for solidarity and silence no more. So get on this mic loud and proud and celebrate each other. So thank you so much for holding space for my words and my intentions tonight. Um, we have an amazing lineup and I wanted to go ahead and start us out with a feature um, who I have met only through the virtual mic scene during quarantine and I'm so honored that um, this feature is here tonight. So I'll go ahead and invite uh, Marcia Peschke she is this amazing poet who's coming to us from abroad and um, has uh, definitely graced us with some beautiful poetry along the way. Marcia Peschke is a multidisciplinary artist and daydreamer. She works with written text, dance, aerial arts, and, the, and performance art. Her work examines how writing and dancing the, the self acts as a form of empowerment. Marcia previously lectured in drama studies for the Durban University of Technology in South Africa. Since 2016, Marcia has had the privilege of exploring her art uh, practice in South Korea and Thailand. She has most recently worked on projects combining poetry and somatic dance movement. So let's everybody give a welcome to Marcia Peschke. And Marcia, if I've uh, mispronounced your name, please correct me. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so glad you can join us and that this time actually aligned with uh, your ability to be here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make sure if you can hear me clearly. You sound perfect, thank you. 
All right. Um, thank you so much for the space. And um, I've chosen poems that I feel will comment on the way women are socialized. And I like to look at how being socialized means we're under surveillance. And that can come in the form of violence. Um, it can come in the form of having to behave in a way that makes us appetizing enough for people. And so I hope that my poems reflect that. So I'm going to start with my first one called The Reason Why. I'm good at keeping secrets, but I'm not good at living with them. I Marcia, I think you're cutting out a little bit. Marcia? Right. Thing Marcia, about a, a blade that. of white flour. I right. didn't get a good grade for it. Remember the old video games with the cart jump ball holders? Okay, um, let me do this. So sorry. Okay. Um, all right. I can remember writing about a blade of white flower grass. I didn't. get a good grade for it. I got a four out of ten four. I can remember the old Marcia, I'm so sorry, we're having a hard time hearing. I'm wondering if you're able to turn your video game with the cartridge. My favorite was the circus game. Jumping over the beach balls before they hit you. That's how old I was. Maybe So I'm so sorry. I'm going to try to reach out to her and uh, see if we can get her connected. Um, Thank you for understanding that, you know, with these times we're in, technology can be so challenging um, and we're trying our best to stay connected. So I'm going to see if I can uh, message her about um, reconnecting. Um, oh, it looks like she's coming back in. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your patience. Marcia, can you hear us okay? I can. Can you hear me now? Yes, I'm wondering if maybe uh, if you share maybe with the video off, uh, maybe that will help with the connection. Okay, I'm fine with doing that. Okay, thank you for your patience. Okay, no worries. Thank you. No problem. All right. There was a man standing in front of me and I couldn't speak because he had his tongue in my mouth. It took me a while to grow taller. It was short for a long time, but my voice stayed kind of small. It was like constantly having someone shove my voice down my throat and having his voice inside of me. That's the age where your friends drink bleach and you know it's not period pains. They're just trying to kill the man screaming in their throats. I had to collapse the details of my voice into words. I'm now tall enough so that when this man swings his hand, it reaches my ear. And because I've just gotten a new piercing, it draws blood. I hope he doesn't do it again because one day I hope to hear myself speak. It's difficult carrying so many men's screams one guy lies so much until I can't get food down my throat. I'm now as tall as I can get. There's a man standing in front of me. He wants me to wear sunglasses so that he doesn't have to blink twice. He picks me up and he throws me and he laughs and I stay. And when he has his tongue in my mouth, he's laughing at me. It's like I'm in that circus game. 
I have to jump before the ball hits me. And it's like there's people throwing swords at me. And I want them to stop. But I, I can't speak because his tongue is in my mouth. And the next one, Nick, remember this when kissing me. What is the language after you kissed me? What did it taste like? What shapes did my tongue form into? What did it speak? Did it lick violently? Or did you give thoughts to me? Did you speak me into exile? Is this why I resent my hips? Because they can't fit into colonial seams? Is this why I'm constantly hungry? Because it's your thoughts running inside of me. Was it a speech you rooted into me? What is the language I speak? Does it have a silhouette, some shape? Is it useful to me? Okay, and my third poem is called Beats. I am a bare mattress waiting for the next face down silent scream. He keeps at my throat, a shirtless boy who crafts for me this narrative. I am a bare mattress cushioning the shirtless boy. People live with me like they're going to move out. And when I write, when I write them into my nightmares, I ask, why do you struggle? I've died since the first man. My hands never reach me. We hush, hold our breaths. Tension, release. My heart is the triton, the mattress springs beating in agony. Under his gaze, she is an elderly painting. Colors, cataract, dark blue gray pours in from the top of the sky. Face down, like tree branches growing against a wall, caressing where their shadows meet. When we dip our heads in shame, our bodies are hung like fruit from trees. I hushed, hold my breath, split into tension, release. Okay. Um, and next is a personal um, sort of narrative where I, I, I guess I was trying to figure myself out. Um, I have a friend I've gotten quite close to and he's in Poland at the moment and I call him my brother. And, and he, he recently asked me some really personal questions and I think he was a way of answering those questions in me. There is a screaming in agony. The lines running under my eyes are taut, low-hanging cables, sky roots plucked as if to send vibrations into me. But somehow the noise doesn't reach me. The sound is unreliable, flimsy. I climb into this image, into the screen, into the noiseless mouth. I'm in search of a voice that can sermonize all of the ways I've been. The voice grown tired of reciting milestones. As I reach into me, I see that I was never simply the color beige to begin with. A collection of foam stoles show that I fill in the space with proof of being alive. Certain stoles show images of empty chairs and sofas because I sometimes imagine myself forgotten. An old poem shows that I am vast and that when I am cloaked, I am in the shape of a castle. Walls, impenetrable. Inside me lies a murderous city. In one image, I am a cool girl in a cafe. She eats in a romantic way spoon to the mouth, chocolate flake curls, heavy cream, crust pastry, fudge dream, bittersweet. 
This is how someone's skin tastes for the first time. In my landscape shots, the earth is breathing. A shot of the exterior shows me walking in the street. The road is hot and boiling. I am a shallow steamed glass case dropped out of the mouth. The future vision of me. All of these, the personas in me. Some of them seen through misty windows like blurry cars or smudged woods on paper. They exist and they belong to me. Um, and my final poem um, is called Present. And I'd like to think that it's, it will reflect the journey that I see myself on in terms of trusting myself, my voice, and allowing myself to heal. I no longer love the men who defeated me, those who wanted to watch me cutting through water, through bootleg copies of me. My past selves opened the doors to their fortress when I sang songs from my belly. What will I say once I return from the forest? What will I say to myself? Only your faces to notice you. Be wild, embrace softness as it should be. And that's it. <laughs> I think we, we can all unmute and snap and you know share how much we enjoyed your words, Marcia. Thank you for sharing your you. courageous you. vulnerabilities in these poems. You know, um, very empowering to just think about um, the details in each piece and Thank you also for joining us tonight. Please share if you can in the chat um, how we can stay in touch with you. And do you have any other projects or um, uh, anything else you'd like to share with us tonight? Um, I spent a large portion of the lockdown in Thailand putting my poems together. And what I plan to do hopefully next year is to publish, I might self-publish my work. So I'm currently editing and then I hope that I can publish next year. And um, I'm actually very glad to be doing this because I will, will be leaving Thailand and everything is sort of tying up and I'll be moving to Korea soon. And hopefully I can do um, projects that will allow me to explore poetry and movement together because I plan on pursuing dance movement psychotherapy. Mm. I believe in art as a form of healing and I'd like to use my writing as well as dance to open up space for other people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's really a privilege to have you here um, sharing your work with us and um, also, uh, please feel free to let us know how to follow you in the chat um, because you also do share some beautiful movement pieces that, um, that you've been working on. So uh, thank you for being in community with us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to your book. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, uh, our next feature isn't quite here yet. Um, so I will gladly open it up to some open mic shares. Um, I do have three people on the list so far. If you'd like to join us and share some poetry tonight, please go ahead and type in solidarity into the chat box and I will add you to the list. Um, I wanna go ahead and uh, invite the first person who signed up and apologies, uh, I hope you're ready. <laughs> um, that uh, the first person was Eric Devon if you could go ahead and share one piece with us um, and we'll do one piece for now. And then if there's time at the end to share a second piece, um, we'll go ahead and, and, and invite that. Um, so Eric Devon, please go ahead and share a piece with us. And thank you for being here. I do. Uh, first of all, yo, that poetry was gorgeous. I hate that the reception was spotty because I wanted to soak in every word and I need that collection that's gonna be something special. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> 
for having me and I'm enjoying it so far. I wrote this piece a few hours ago at work. Um, I work at Amazon and I was picking boxes and I walked on to, uh, I walked up to this um, this one palette and the shape of it <laughs> there was a hole in it and my, my daughter likes to hide in small spaces so <clears throat> there's no title to it at work a warehouse bristling and bustled against the season's yule a pallet of boxes is stacked in a square with long overlapping sides. So there is a hole down the middle. There's a hole down the center of this low slung monument to capitalism. Looking into the middle of this space, I smile at my daughter's face, cast back up at me, proud of this game she has wrought. We, the warehouse and I conjure her often like this. A soft, happy, and full of play. Some days it is the only of her I have. Twice last week and tonight, she refused the time a judge declared me worthy of claiming. And although she is only this many, excluding her thumb, and this is only a new game she has invented, having discovered her voice, willful and brash, the best new hiding place. And although I know I should laugh and gather her up, a wriggling bouquet of dandelion blown free, I too feel the press on all sides and can't, for the life of me, see what she loves so much about sinking into small spaces with barely room to breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That was, uh, Mercia mentioned, so much tenderness. Um, it was so grounding to hear you share your poem too and what a phenomenal piece to have just written recently um thank you for sharing and being here um i'd like to go ahead and invite our next open mic share um mr titozamok um apologize if i'm not pronouncing that correctly um but you've been a regular with our mic and i'm so glad you're here tonight and look forward to hearing what you're going to share so feel free to uh share with us all right, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, it's always a surprise, right? This piece is titled Solastalgia. It has to be more than a neologism, more than an emotional or existential distress. It has to be more than the live experience, more than the negatively perceived environmental change. It has to be more than the loss of 98% of your land base, more than 30 million whose trail of tears walked onto the Milky Way, the skyward roadway to the ancestors. It has to be more than the boarding school childish tears as they flay your culture like a skin, more than the animalization at the hands of your oppressor. It has to be more than the fog of morning, more than what is intransitively already lost. It has to be more than the homesickness of post-traumatic stress, more than the anxiety of what is to be lost, a kind of pre-traumatic stress. It has to be more than the volcanic eruptions, more than the destructive strip mining. It has to be more than the quotidian homesickness more than the distress caused by social change. Beyond the persistent droughts of rural New South Wales, beyond the impact of large scale open cut wounds of coal mining in the upper Hunter Valley, beyond the loss of the once predictable environment in BIPOC communities, beyond the interaction of society and community, social political ways, the experience of community and its loss of power over its well being, the potent impotency, 
beyond BIPOC communities grounded in livelihoods tied to the earth and the weather, agrarians, fisher folks, and gatherers. But the higher income communities can quickly rebuild their homes after the destruction from a wildfire. Wealth can shield you from that anxiety. But wealth prevents your community from mountaintop removal, the toxic battery plant next to your golf course, the political power that wealth buys is preventative. The lingering influence of interpersonal violence, community conflict, family structures, economic status will determine the mental health and well being. The chain of causation will show its slippage with psychosocial distress of emergency workers and first responders due to the social community health deterioration putting them in post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and panic. But we must move beyond the historical traumas, the intergenerational traumas and persistent external and self-inflicted stresses of social, economical, institutional, judicial, and interpersonal. We must move beyond the stress of prolonged exposure to physical, mental, and spiritual oppression. We must not suffer these epigenetic changes to our progeny and lineage. These ghosts haunting future generations who's, who are not sure why these afflictions are affecting them in known and unknown ways. Ultimately, we are 8% originated from viruses, more bacterial cells than human cells, mycelial and evolutionary, and finally, our quorum sensing can be triggered by Joisman, the order of the earth at five parts per trillion. Thank you so much for sharing. I think what, what I appreciate about your poetry is it is always a commentary on what's like happening now, um, but also how the history that got us here has affected us in the now. and. So I appreciate those, uh, the way your poetry invites us to uh, reflect and shift our perspectives. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it very much. Yes, thank you for being here again. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more of your work. And we do have some more folks on the mic uh, signed up. I think we'll continue on with our mic. And I apologize. Um, for uh, Eros J. De La Torre, if they're able to uh, join in, we might just kind of um, bring in their feature um, when they come in. But we have an amazing next uh, share, um, Andrea Santana, who uh, I've had the pleasure of creating music with. And we've had, we've written poetry together and I'm just super honored that she's here tonight and looking forward to hear what she has to share. So Andrea, if you could go ahead and uh, take the mic. Is that, can you guys hear me? Okay, yep. cool. <laughs> it was my first time um, turning on my mic on a Zoom and I don't have the chat box, but I have solidarity and I love you guys. And um, this one's called Vacant Heart and I wrote it um, like post a breakup at the beginning of the year, uh, last year, <laughs> uh, really nervous. <laughs> Vacant heart, don't fill me up with trash. Got me a belly and I'm working on my ass, on my ass. Love you forever, but now I've got to go. Love you forever, but now I've got to go. You use me, abuse me. Did you choose me when there were still so many girls around? Vacant heart. Ooh, I 
and go to bed i feel dead your truth became your lies again it's got to end no more friend you used me abused me did you choose me when there were still so many girls around vacant hearts? I can't help. Don't love me. Don't love me. I can't help. I love you forever. I can't help. Don't love me. Don't love me. I can't help. I love you forever. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And there aren't too many people here. So if you all want to unmute and snap throughout the night, um, I'm open to it. Uh, I would just be respectful of like reading yourself back. Um, Thank you for sharing your music with us, Andrea. I miss your voice. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. Um, and yeah, I wanna, I wanna just say I hope I hope you keep uh, singing and sharing, uh, you know, with other mics and with us in the future. So thank you, Andrea. Um, we have a couple more folks signed up on the mic. I'm gonna go ahead and invite uh, Crystal Ray to share with us, um, and then up next after that will be Caro Scott. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, all right, I'm gonna just jump in. No exposition. Um, I'm ready, but I'll be. I'm strong today, but tomorrow, tomorrow's coming. And with that, the morning, and this crawl will be walking and this walking will be running. So don't count me out, cause I ain't nothing now, but, but now don't never last long. And I ain't ready, but I will be by the time I finish this song. Sands, they stay shifting and the dogs stay lying and the sun keep rising looking for me and I keep breathing and I keep fighting. I ain't ready now, but I'm going to be. So don't, don't count me out because I ain't nothing now. Because now don't never last long. I ain't ready, but I will be by the time I finish this song. Thank you guys. Woo! Thank you so much, Crystal. Woo! Thank you. Yes. I, I appreciate that, the vulnerability and that peace and, and it feels relatable too. So thank you so much for sharing. And, um, you know, we're kind of going ahead schedule tonight. So uh, we might have in that another round of open mic if you all want to share a second piece. Um, totally welcome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and invite our next open mic share. And if you want to share again, feel free to hit solidarity, uh, put solidarity in the chat box. Um, I would love to hear more of all of y'all's work. So um, I really appreciate you being here. So I'm going to invite Carl Ska to the mic. Hi, Carl. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really enjoying everyone's um, everyone's poetry tonight, as always. Um, okay, so I'm going to read uh, this piece called <clears throat> Anxiety is How Your Bones Hunger. Anxiety is how you lose yourself in your bones, hating the vibrations of your skin. Anxiety is your inability to breathe, where air sticks in your throat and your lungs choke. It's the itch you scratch until your flesh peels off. It's the itch hydrocortisone won't relieve. Anxiety is how your jaw clenches, how your teeth scrape against each other, how your eye muscles can't relax and your temples throb. It's the shots of tequila you sneak in the kitchen. You'd rather feel nothing than the beef panting and prickling in your belly. Soon you are detached. You are a burning lake of honey. You don't feel drunk or buzzed, just no longer present, and you are grateful to not witness your own unraveling. Your eyelids tumble closed, your brain sticky and thick. You feel the sun traveling across the sky, dropping into the horizon. 
You witness how the light shifts in your room. You wait until it's gray, no hints of orange. Anxiety is sleep abandoning you. When no position is comfortable, when it's too hot and too cold, it's binge watching Netflix while feeling guilty, while reminding yourself that sometimes you need this. Every hour Netflix asks, you wanna continue watching and you tap yes, afraid of what will happen when you return to reality. Anxiety is where your bones come to eat when they hunger for something other than your flesh. Um, and that's that piece. Um, yeah, and I just, I've been writing a lot of pieces around mental health. Um, it's gonna be sort of the center point of my next um, book that I'm writing. Cause I feel like, yeah, it's just something that, um, I don't know, yeah, it needs to be talked about more um, to destigmatize it. And, um, you know, I think it's, yeah, it's a lot of things that um, we go through um, and I'm trying to sort of, yeah, write through that, um, write through that experience. So th thank you all for um, allowing me the space. Thank you, Caro. And uh, Caro also has a book out, a chat book. If you want to uh, share that info in the chat box, Caro, that would be awesome. I highly recommend it. It's phenomenal poetry. And um, thank you for sharing uh, a very human experience in your piece. And um, it feels really relatable in that level too. Um, and I appreciate you writing about mental health. That is definitely something we need to um, talk more about and and um, be in community about uh, you know together to to keep nurturing each other along the way in our own processes. So thank you so much, Carl. Um, I'm super excited to keep the open mic going. Um, we're going to go for another round. If anybody else wants to share a second piece, we have uh, someone signed up to share again. Um, and uh, we'll be kind of diving into some features, some more features shortly. Um, but let's go ahead and hear some more on the mic. Again, if you want to share again, uh, put solidarity in the chat box. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Tezozomok again to share. And then we'll have Eric Devon after that. Thank you. All right. Here is another, let's see what this one goes. The city. I remember the first time I went to town, my grandmother gave me one of my grandpa's old red paisley handkerchiefs. It was a kind of worn with a couple of seam stitches where it holes used to be. Long gone was the splendor of the post Mughal empire versions of design from India, especially in the former Kashmir shawls. It was simply a moko rag. Grandma was excited for my trip to the local town several miles away, requiring an early dawn start time and long ride on horseback across rough, roadless terrains and rapid rivers. Just before she shuffled me out of the Ramada, she showed me how she wrapped coins in one of the corners of the handkerchief, double knotted it with nudo ciego. The other corner, she rolled up a couple of bills and the third one, she wrapped some chiles. And the last one, she wrapped some chunky salt grains. She rendered my handkerchief useless for its true purpose. But I was well equipped for the city and accepted the Stephen J. Goulian evolutionary adaptation of this new tool. As I walked to my donkey, she whispered warnings in my ear. As we climbed the Trigomil mountain and descended to the rapid river, I could hear the echoes of her words linger in my mind. As if her words came from the mist of the rapid waters, she haunted me like the Llorona. Mijo, the city will sneak up on you. And this has its own agency. Como que te hace desear, te siembra un rencor, un deseo de cosas que no tienes. It will make you desire, breed a rancor and jealousy, a desire for things you don't have. Its function is to amplify ese rencor, to make you desire. The rapids were above my thighs and my donkey was floating. We had begun drifting like the hypotenuse of a triangle, hoping to overcome the drag of the rapids and make it to the other end. As the rapids dragged us, I floated in a composite ship, which I was part of. And grandma's words continued to haunt me. You will inhale the city. It deposits itself in your lungs. If you open your mouth too much, ay, una garrapata que se pega en la lengua. There is a louse 
that will settle on your tongue and start to eat it. And eventually it will eat it out and replace itself there. Y cuando comes, te roba una parte de tu comida. When you eat, it will steal your food. Vas a hablar pendejadas. You will lose your language and speak the desires of the city. No vas a poder hablar tus deseos. You will not be able to speak your desires. It will no longer be your agency or your will. You will be the city. When we entered the city and started crawling through the pestilent ridden alleys, I had to take that handkerchief my grandmother had given me and made sure I didn't breathe in the city, kept my tongue moist and sealed tight in my mouth. Thank you so much for sharing again. I really love all the details in your pieces too. Um, it, it really invites us to be right there with you and the storytelling that you have in your pieces. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and invite Eric Devon back to the mic. After Eric, we'll have Crystal and then uh, Jessica, and then we'll dive into some features. So uh, Eric, would you please join us? All right, uh, thank you. Mini, mini, mighty mo. <laughs> I'm gonna go with this one. Okay. <clears throat> our, lo our looting within meets the burn without. There's always a river. It's a quote from Denez Smith. The day after the latest riot, 210 westbound, the curve between home and the job is littered with cars, busted, broken. The last up on cinder blocks with no wheels, the way they always are in movies. The warehouse requires we wear mandatory masks, although they recycle what waste we exhale. Protection is now anything that covers the nose and mouth. If you can talk, you can breathe. White men are soft in greeting me today. I say hi and notice they watch me for longer than is comfortable, as if waiting to see whether my breath will feed flames into their tender lungs. And suddenly, the bandana I've worn for the last month seems so much a brighter red. And with every black man who passes me, I lock eyes. The extended glance says, you ready to burn all this shit? A casual upward nod answers, hell yeah, just say the word. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for that piece and for writing about the times we have been in. Um, I really appreciate how you capture that with your poem. Um, so next up will be Crystal Ray. Thank you for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay. No exposition. She wasn't supposed to know, but she saw him whispering and the kids tiptoeing and caught the cat kicking the dog out the corner of her eye and she knew. Tonight, when she comes home from work on the other side of her front door, we'll be 30 or so middle-aged adults crouching in her living room, stooped in squats their thighs can't support, waiting, sweating, stupidly in the dark, prepared to shout, surprise! And so she kept driving right past her house and let their thighs burn, surprise. Thanks guys. Thank you, Crystal. Woo -woo -woo. I appreciate you being here and sharing again. And I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and invite uh, Jessica M. Wilson uh, to the mic. Um, Jessica is the 
founder and the um, guiding light for Los Angeles Poets Society. So I'm excited that she's here to share a piece with us. And after Jessica, we will invite our next uh, featured guest uh, to the mic. So go ahead, Jessica, you have the mic. Hi everyone, happy Sunday, one mic, one globe, 2020. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Sorry, it's the last one of the year, everyone, before we all turn into pumpkins, I guess, for 2021, whatever, whatever is gonna happen, I don't know, all this crazy energy, right? Um, but Juan tells me that the planets are aligned, like right now, like perfectly, so it's a pretty beautiful celestial time and happy solstice tomorrow, winter solstice begins, so big blessings and love to everyone. I've been really enjoying the, the December poetry challenge with all these prompts and, uh, you know, it's just been a joy to write so much. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I'm trying to keep up with Gato, so, and Mauricio, so I'm like, I've got to write something, you know? So thank you for motivating me, hermana. Thank you, Mauricio, too, if he hears this uh, <clears throat> video or this uh, program. So yesterday was hummingbird, and oh, I wish I had. I, I want my Juan. Do you mind getting my glow shocking necklace? Um, well, anyway, let me start with a poem from my book, Being Human. Um, it's hanging up over there. <clears throat> it's yeah, and um, it's published in the Coiled Serpent Anthology by Thea Chucha Press, and also in my book, Serious Longing, and it's dedicated to all the humans in the house in the house all right <laughs> yes, baby. being human feeling desolate in this space where time meshes into the host of my death an uncertain slumber of right a net of collection why does it always come down to money to raise your hopes, your praises, to make you feel like a good human, a happy human. Justify me this feeling of incompleteness because I do not have enough paper to go around taking away all the hands I owe. Is my life less valuable because I cannot pay someone today? Is my life less valuable because I do not have enough green to pay. Am I deemed to tire tread and sidewalk skid because I came up short? Well, how short of human am I since I have no green to give? Since when did paper inject itself into our veins? The needles blended into the stream of blood, plasma, capillaries, dust. There is no green in my blood. There is no green in my blood. I am not rich. I am not paper. I'm human. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Jessica. Thank you. And um, this next poem I want to share, I uh, caught off my press off my pen from yesterday. I had some steam coming off my pen. Juan can testify to that. <laughs> I couldn't even concentrate. It was just like, like really big and lean back. <laughs> but uh, the, the day 19 prompt was hummingbird. And uh, I wanna give love to my sister, uh, Seha. She's a, a brown girl fly. She makes these beautiful creations. This is called Shaki. I love this necklace. It gives me so much like, I just feel so like powerful when I wear this. Um, I'm gonna put it on right now, actually. Let me get these Mickey ears off. <clears throat> there we go. So I'll try to get it up the higher there so you can see. But this is really for her, for Kolashaki. Um, but here we go. Hummingbird of humility across the sky. Why did you think your sister was wrong? Deceived goddess who now holds the moon. When you see and look up, 
you see me looking at you, following you each night, a reminder eternal of the cruelty you've done. Hummingbird warrior, hold your name with might. Colibri, Huitzilopochtli, you will know me always. Goilchaki. <clears throat> Moon goddess, hold me in your might and keep me, protect me, protect my heart so that I may see without this threshold of pain. Did father know how much daughter would hold? How much strength? Did father know how much pain she'd bear? Why is the daughter always cast alone? And why the woman, why woman assistant of evil, of deception, and that goddamn apple? Why do they tell us that all the time? Why that? Are we villain? Pitchfork moon goddess of mer mercurial season, you are the reason of our birth woman, a queen, to give life and nothing more, she keeps us living. And that's dedicated to all womankind and also for girl Shaki. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And uh, if you don't know what the about Koi Shaki and we sleep with Lopochli, he's um, the hummingbird is his uh, 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 symbol, but um, in creation, uh, he was born um, actually tomorrow, <laughs> and he killed his sister, Shaki because he was trying to protect his mother. He beheaded her, and now she became the moon. Her, her head her, is the moon, um, but he was wrong in killing her. He made a mistake. He killed her falsely, and this is... Um, uh, uh, Nahuatl, uh, Mexicayo, uh, native Mexican, if you will. This is um, the the uh, the creation story of, of those two deities. So that's where that comes. But thank you so much for having me, and uh, I enjoyed sharing that. Um, I was just like feeling it. Like, why are women pegged as villain? The stinking apple. Like, oh, don't trust a woman. She's gonna make you change, make you change your mind and do something naughty. And and like we're a tag for life, you know. But we are the force of life we sustain life so power to my women all women all womankind oh mateo and thank you for having me alex when mike when glow thank big you. love blessings for allowing this to even exist um i really appreciate you sharing your words with us tonight and um we are going to have a second round of open mic but i'd like to bring it to some features um, I'm going to try to make this uh, co-host thing happen for our next feature. Um, and I'm really excited to be in community with this feature because I have also met this feature virtually. And I know, I hope one day, uh, the folks I've met virtually, I can meet you in person like Marcia as well. Um, but uh, Micah has been an amazing, um, uh, person in, in the poetry scene that I've met through another poet, uh, Sabrina M, who actually introduced us and has been a feature here with us before for our first uh, One Mic, One Globe. So I'm excited to introduce Micah. Micah Tasaka is a queer, non-binary, mixed Japanese poet, multidisciplinary artist, and Reiki master from Colton, California. They are author of Expansions. Jamie Publishing 2017, and co-editor at Innate Divinity Books. You can follow Micah at www.micatasaka.com, or um, I believe the social media handles are uh, kinokono inaka, underscore inaka. So I'll have Micah um, make sure that you share your um, contact in the, in the chat box. Um, but please take the mic and uh, you know, share your poetry with us. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, 
Cool. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Alex, for hosting and like asking me to be a part of this. Um, this is my first time coming to this open mic too, so I'm really excited to see what's going on. Um, okay, so I have some visuals with my uh, reading tonight, so we are going to jump in to some visuals too, if that's cool. Um, I'm a teacher by day, so um, this is what we do, you know. Um, okay, so. Um, I also just uh, a few months ago in the summer moved back from um, Japan to um, California. Um, I had been living out there for the last two years. Um, and so like tonight I want to talk about like a concept, um, the concept of like the Trans-Pacific. Um, and that's something that I've lately been exploring through my art, um, like the different ways that I can like reach across um, the line or like the border that is the Pacific Ocean. Um, and in the last two years, I crossed the Pacific Ocean six times. And so um, I feel like I've been wanting to um, explore that experience through art. Um, so this first poem is called The Trans-Pacific Cactus. And it's um, one of the very first poems that I wrote since coming back to the States. Um, yeah. Okay, The Trans-Pacific Cactus. My father dances around the cactus garden. Regardless of what thorns might stick him, he tells me to water the trans cactus. He says trans and my body grows thorns. He dances around them. I say trans and mean the way the Pacific Ocean shifted my gender each time I traversed it to return to the true countryside that pulled flowers from my skin so I could wiggle my body over a line in the ground that becomes less significant each time I cross it. He says trans and means the cactus we just dumped from the pot into the soil, but a feeling hangs in the air, like when you know you said the wrong thing, but hope no one catches you. And isn't that also a lesson in planting? My dad turns the shovel towards the sky, pokes the handle into the dirt several times, says, you have to pack it in like this. I learned this on the ranch. And I'm thinking of the ways that he too has repotted himself and how all transplants must feel awkward as they reach towards the sun from a new position. And aren't we all a shifting arc towards the feeling of sunlight, letting it and nothing else lead our movements, whether we be vacant bodies or a room incomplete without candlelight, a countertop drowning in piles of junk mail, my shoulder that pops less each day that I do my stretches. There is no more space until we make some. So my father and I dance around the garden with both arms lifted, praising this and every moment that we allow ourselves to grow. Um, okay, so this next slide requires like some more exposition, I suppose. Um, but I also want to give a trigger warning um, that the next two pieces um, mention um, murder slash suicide, um, racism, and violence. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, if anyone needs to like jump off to not listen to that, like no offense whatsoever. Um, so part of what, um, so I was working in Japan as a teacher, but part of what I was able to do out there was um, research my family history. Um, and I found this um, lost like story um, that happened in New York in the um, 1920s. And um, based off of like this um, newspaper article that I found um, about these two people. So this is um, Hari Kanichi Tosaka, and this is Yasio Tosaka. Um, this is like a real life picture of her. And um, so um, Harry was on trial uh, for the murder of his wife, Yasio. And um, he was convicted to life in prison, but um, their experience was really interesting because um, Harry claimed that he didn't murder his wife because she committed harakiri, which is um, Japanese ritual suicide. Um, but she was killed, like in this picture, by a butter knife to the butter knife to the throat. And they left behind three children: um, Arthur, Alice, and Henry. And um, Henry is my grandpa. Um, so this is a story that, like. I was never told my entire life. Um, my dad didn't know this story. I don't think my grandpa knew this story. Um, so it was very hidden from us. And there's like a lot of like 
cultural disconnect that came out of this experience. Um, so this next piece is actually a blackout piece um, based off of this um, newspaper article. Um, yeah, okay. So it's called One Side of the Tree, Why My Father Didn't Teach Me Japanese Version 1. The three of Third Avenue watched a soundless tragedy. A woman cut from ear to ear, brown hands found a childish cry was wasted on the ugly wound. Three children experienced loneliness for some time, no question of guilt, but in living on, the only way was stoicism. Tried to kill a stain that broke the custom. The weapon was public fault, governed by some other nation. The law distinguished Japanese as unworthy. Drawing the knife across the throat, plunging the dagger into Tasaka's own words. Um, okay, this next one um, is called The Ugly Wound. Um, and lately through poetry, I've been trying to like um, unearth, heal, I don't know the right word, um, like ancestral trauma, um, particularly this experience because it was like, it created like a, a severance in my family history so that that doesn't get passed down, you know what I mean? Um, so I've been um, exploring like using poetry as a means to communicate with like ancestors or like ghosts um, and uncovering like the stories that were lost to culturally racial um, racism and violence. So this is the ugly wound um, writing in the spaces of a wound. Hail the holy ugly hole the impermanent permanence that stares back at me through a gap in a tree, the leaves all shaken, the reverberations of falling, a natural death. There is nothing natural about falling when it steals all our words and gives back silence, the beauty that only hangs the leftover skin and bones after prepping grief for dinner. I made you a plate tonight, set it on an altar until it turned cold and stale and ants tore it to shreds, carried it to your body somewhere. Somewhere there is a grave no one in my family has ever seen. I imagine it overgrown with weeds, having never known the delicacy of a single flower. And yet the ugly wound, the butter knife that tore a rift in a story that slashed the vocal cords of generations, may we never speak of such gory unholy. I imagine a funeral for someone I never knew as the least satisfying to a ghost. Yet the thought of being a thought, one might think must bring some thought of relief. To be forgotten is to live as a void, painfully floating in the silence. Maybe you came to my dreams one night or two, or maybe I have only dreamt of you my entire life and yet still never put a name to a face, to a story I was never told, the stories I was never told, the ones wrapped in bouquets before tossed from a window. I fall backwards every time, the beautiful wound that opened a portal, and in this rift we dance, aware of what we have become. The worlds between us that speak of trepidations and falling. Today I fall a million times. I crunch leaves in my palms and hold the remnants as an offering where nothing is as magnificent as these gaps between our voices. What will we speak of when we are both made of ash and can congeal the misinterpretations that often spread over a valley? Take me to the valley, watch over me as I lay my head on the grass and cry my body into driftwood, saltless and longing for an ocean. I too have crossed the surging sea only to unbury pain where there should be nothing but love and breathed fire into the sun, watched it melt as I grew entirely whole, made of rays and swallowing the moon and every chasm between now and our reunited eternity. This is how I choose to remember you. Um, all right, this is, is it okay to do one more, Alex? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, this is the last one. Um, and yeah, um, maybe no context <laughs> um, and no title. Oh, so this is a picture of where I was living, um, this cute little place with the sunflowers. Um, on this side of the water, I'm freezing at the base where once the roots are severed, there is no trace of 
Ask me where I come from when I have no family branches to tell the name of a town or the way it looks upon leaving. Behind me, there is a shore begging my waves to crash in the simplest grace to fill the air with prayer again. But here I am, the nameless, last pen stroke full of dying ink. And isn't that just like a poet to go off on tangents when the tangible lives inside a croaking frog's mouth, hailing the coming spring? I have been waiting to say my existence is something other than othered, less a victim than a vicious storm caught in mellow weather. Watch me rain down. Watch me river into dreaming and riptide all the words lost in language. I am the unspeaking foreigner who holds the chopsticks well but can't construct complete sentences to explain the leftover feeling of being both away and home spun into a web that says I am not here. I am not of here. I'm somewhere other than here, but I am here connecting the splintered pieces of a tree trunk after lightning hits and leaves all smoldering. I am touching the smoke and saying it is real. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Thank you so much Mika, for sharing, um, sharing not only your visuals and your really potent poetry, but just the accompaniment, accompaniment of those two and also the um, the stories you're sharing with us of your family history and your own journey with exploring that. I mean, thank you so much for featuring tonight and, and sharing that with us. Um, what can we do to stay in touch with you and what other projects do you have coming up? Um, yeah, so um, you can find my books on Amazon. Um, I can post the link. Um, I also have a website and it's just my name, micatazaka.com. Um, where soon you'll be able to like book Reiki sessions with me. Um, soon, it's still in the works, but hopefully 2021. Um, beyond that, uh, my Instagram is Kinoko no Inaka. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm like working on new stuff, but um, kind of aimlessly because I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to piece together, but hopefully soon. So um, thank you though for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Micah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just love that I met you through a, a you know, just a, a, a hangout session on Zoom for um, just self care and connecting with community. And um, you know, it's just been great to hear each other's poetry along the way. And um, look forward to learning more and hearing more of your new stuff too. So, um, thanks for being here. I'd like to go ahead and invite our next feature who uh, is very close to the LA Poet Society uh, family and that he is a big part of it. Um, our next feature is Juan Cardenas. Cardenas. And um, I'm super excited that he uh, is gracing his presence with us tonight because um, Juan is a flutist, vocalist, poet, activist, and educator to the bilingual community, specializing in teaching poetry and music to the youth. He is a poet teacher with the California Poets in the Schools, um, working with native Spanish speakers and youth of diverse cultural backgrounds. Juan is part of 100,000 Poets and Musicians for Change and the Revolutionary Poets Brigade Los Angeles. He is the author of The Beat of an Immigrant Chicano from Swan World Press. So I am super excited to bring Juan uh, to the mic. Thank you, Juan. Hi, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for all your beautiful voices and all the, uh, the poetry. My God, that was, that was such beautiful poetry. Um, I really appreciate the space. And um, uh, like Alex mentioned, um, I, I teach poetry. I'm an educator with California Poets in the Schools. Uh, I'm a poet, and I just released um, my book, The Beat of an Immigrant Chicano, just this year. It's just a book of poetry. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's poetry uh, about, about me crossing the border uh, when I was a kid uh, and, and, and uh, pretty much my life. And, and and here and you know overcoming racism and overcoming everything that that one has to uh, you know confront as as you cross the border as you're a fresh immigrant from from Mexico. So that's uh, I'm going to read about this. Um, but uh, like Alex mentioned, I'm, I'm also a musician, I'm a flutist, and and I can't help myself but to play music. And uh, music is a big poetry, a big poetry is a big part of my poetry, and poetry is, is a big part of, of my music. Um, 
So, you know, I, I, I mix them. <laughs> I mix them and just lately, um, I, I have two babies that, you know, I always accompany me in the background. So that's, it's always beautiful. Um, uh, I love, I love blues and I love, uh, and I love poetry. So I did this thing called um, blues beat and beat haikus. Um, and, and it's not the first time uh, anybody does it. Jack Kerouac did it before. And he, uh, he actually has like a 40 minute uh, blues and, 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 and haikus, but this is eight. Eight, eight uh, beat haikus and blues. Um, so here it comes. Blues and beat haikus, breathing my soul through the flute, bleeding ink to page. Instrument five seven five one four five poetic syllables. <laughs> Selling everything somewhere else will buy again to sell it again. <laughs> to the crows crawling under the border, wings guiding me home. <laughs> Through the steel fence gap, screaming and crying from fear, reaching for my hand. so bright, black before our eyes, sunset marked our stride. <laughs> Coyote spirit, when you danced in your fire, did you see me cross? <laughs> Longing story, unrequired approval of my existence. So that was eight beat haikus in the blues. You know, a little mix that I did, um, just uh, as, as something I can't help to uh, to do. But uh, thank you so much for listening to that. Um, uh, and I, I like to read some from from my book now. So this is pretty much a narrative, poet, a poetic narrative about me crossing the border. There's stories in there as well as, uh, as, as mostly poems. And it's in three chapters. First chapter is that, that, uh, that crossing. Second chapter is, is that feeling of, of, of that depression and that anger, right? Uh, of, of all the racism and all the, you know, uh, the shock, the culture shock. And, uh, and the third chapter is the epiphany, you know, uh, the poet, uh, like uh, th that revolutionary sense. Um, that came to me uh, through belonging and culture. Um, so I want to read one from, from each chapter. And here's the first one. I'm going to read it uh, from the first, actually the first poem from the book called Home Run. Clang. A baseball flew high across Mexican skies as I caught a glimpse of the American desert at the other side of the street, steel fence. It took me two strikes to hit a home run the baseball game that took place on the unpaved streets of TJ, just a few yards away from the border. It was my last day in Mexico, early in the morning, as I sat at the breakfast table of my coyote, eating frijoles de la olla with warm corn tortillas, when I saw a group of boys my age playing United States' favorite pastime sport, baseball. I watched with excitement as I saw one team strike the other out, fouls and home runs, flew above the uphill dirt road, all bases formed with sweaters and Coca-Cola bottles. I hadn't witnessed smiles and playful fun for weeks, 
The night before had been attempt one, a traumatic desperate chance that failed and left me with a chilling sense of mortality. I hadn't ever been so cold. Never had I seen someone so scared. I watched so attentively that my beans were getting cold, imagining myself running for a base. When my mom asked, do you wanna go out and play with them, mijo? That red threaded white leather ball savored the fragile freedom and height of the wind's unpatriotic belonging. Thank you so much. That was um, the first one uh, from the poem, from the book. So here's one from the second um, chapter. Mm -hmm. One second. I know my own book, I swear. Here it is, Desert Baptize. I am a living sacrifice. I'm the story of a boy going to sleep with a rumbling, hungry stomach. I'm the story of being ignored by my father. I'm the poem of a heartache of that mother who was betrayed along with her four children. And she cried out loud and ran down the hall upstairs when her most miserable and demeaning backstab almost jumped off the balcony to end her pain. That short dialogue of crying questions, confusion, that vivid stanza about a tear who got lost in the small gathering pond that the kid cried, shrugged. The lines ran the pipe, tunnel across the hill. A guard shift had made a deal to look the other way. But in darkness, we stayed, waiting for hours for someone to say the word to start climbing to the USA. A guard shift that never took place. The pro starts. We've just crawled underneath the US border, the coyote and I, our clothes dust yellow, Dasher baptized, a groveless pilgrimage awaited us. He never said the word to go, the urgency in his first step signaled. A coyote and his child traveler are seen walking up and down the hills at the mercy of an Indian summer sun. The immigration patrol then pulls over right next to them, ignoring the fact they're traveling north, he hurried to ask, where are you going? Coyote tricked her tongue, then turned into a snake and said, we're just picking up cans, my son and I, in Espanol. If I see you again, I'll take you, Avocado said. I belong to a chance and wit for that instant, while my mind prayed in mercy for a pass. The few of most of the pages you've read, that unwritten conclusion, what kind of story has no end? This living, breathing one, a book unfinished. So that was Desert Baptized. Oh, and I just realized that was actually the first, I mean, the last um, the last uh, po uh, poem from the first chapter, but I'm gonna jump right next to the third one. Um, I, I wrote this poem in 2016. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I wrote this poem in 2014. And, um, and it's just, uh, I, I love it. I, every time I read it, it takes me through through what's still happening today. It's called Change is Inevitable. Message to everyone and everywhere, archangels, elemental and palms, souls of distant realms, and to the breathing machinery, Congress pumps as tears and variable language, change is inevitable. Mystical voice, romanticizing the unobtainable, hypnotism of sensationalism, Armies of incomprehensible prisons with sexless guards and soulless Jehovah's pulling narcissist triggers, dying happily speechless. Change is inevitable. Capitalists, cannibals kissing and hugging flags and rituals for generations with a godless religious momentum. Change is inevitable. Proud police duty inflicting gear, parading fear. Tyrant racist pride drowning your despair in your community. Change is inevitable. Corporate colossal drunks compulsively toasting to the groaning stomachs of their minimum wage employees' children. Change is inevitable. Allah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus, Hadi, Buddha, Omadeo, Mother Earth, Self, Brothers and Sisters, Universe. Change is inevitable. Change is inevitable as you are to me in life. The way we are born out of action which takes place today and miracles, which our words cause. Thank you so much. So in short, like the eight 
eight, you know, eight uh, haikus and 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 blues is like a combination of, of what this book is. Um, and so and, and so this book is, is is that, you know, so um I'll put the information about it. Um I'm only selling it through my local bookstore right now called Tia Chucha Centro Cultural Bookstore, uh, just to support them. Um, I want to sell it in other, other avenues, um, but I'm holding on as much as I can because I really want to support them. This bookstore changed my life um, and, 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 you know, completely, and, and I owe them so much. Um, so anyways, I'll thank you very much for, for listening. I look forward to listening to the other poets, and thank you, Alex, so much for holding the space. So much Juan and thank you for gracing us with uh, your story tonight um, through your poetry but also the, the energy we can feel with that flute as well so thank you for featuring with us and for being such a big part of LA Poets Society and um, appreciate you sharing tonight. Well, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our final feature and after um, after this feature, I'll go ahead and open up uh, to the open mic if you all wanna share again. Um, I really wanna thank all the features for being here tonight. I know I say thank you, thank you, thank you all the time. I just want you to know that it's really, uh, means a lot to the Los Angeles Poets Society uh, that you all come up to the mic and share your stories with us. Um, and this next feature has been somebody who has allowed me to share my own story um, through their platform and many, many other writers. Um, Kamari Carter Hawkins has been an amazing asset to the writing community and I'm so honored that she's here tonight. Uh, Kamari Carter Hawkins is the author of Death by Comb, an amazing book. Uh, she is a poet, author and workshop facilitator based out of Los Angeles, California. She loves cooking, eating tacos, and long walks through indie bookstores. So let's go ahead and welcome Kamari Carter Hawkins uh, to the mic. I'm so glad you're here. Yes, me too. Thank you so much. For really taking the time to be with us. I know <laughs> you are a busy person and you have so many uh, things that you're a part of. And I wanna just say that I appreciate the tenderness in your poems, but also the activism in them as well. And um, I appreciate you sharing with us tonight and, and the ways you keep us writing as well um, beyond just featuring here tonight. Um, what kind of projects or what do you have going on um, that we could share and uh, support? Oh, wow, thank you. Um, I'm working on my second collection of poetry. My first one's called Death by Calm. She's four years old. Woo, child, rough, rough, okay? <laughs> the evolution is real. But if you want to see, you know, the grassroots of it all, um, that is on Amazon and on worldstagepress.org, Death by Comb. But I'm working on my second and I'm pitching myself to um, different presses and see where it goes. So that's what I'm working on. Amazing. And um, uh, what is the best way to follow you and follow your work? I am back on Instagram after like a three month, four month hiatus. <laughs> And I got back on to share about this event too. I was like, oh my God, I gotta share. So thanks for pulling me back into uh, the Instagram world. Uh, Instagram Kamari Creative is the handle. Um, that's the best way I feel like. I'm now on Clubhouse. Clubhouse is a new thing. I don't know, anybody heard of Clubhouse? I don't know, but yeah, Instagram. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Kamari. And, um, you know, I look forward to your next collection and appreciate all the ways that you've kept poetry going during these uh, really, really tough times. And um, you did your virtual chats, Mike, and that was just an amazing space to just keep doing poetry with people somehow, you know, and, um, and then interviewing poets to uh, really highlight their work, uh, including myself. So I really appreciate all that you do for the writing community and for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody unmute, give Kamari some love. And Thank you, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for inspiring us. Yes. Hey, hey, Kamari and her poetry family. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Kamari's mom. <laughs> Hi. Hey, hey. Thank you for supporting.
supporting your your child. I love that. We like which more parents are like that, you know, at all ages. That's really a, a rare and beautiful thing. So it's a it's a beautiful legacy. I love to watch her grow. It's it's unbelievable, you know. Mm, that's oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then to many. So thank you again, Kamari, and um, for all the ways you've kept me writing. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to go ahead and, uh, you know, we've been here together. Let's go ahead and open it up to the open mic. And before we do, I realized I missed one thing. Um, one, how can we follow you and what kind of projects do you have coming up? Because I forgot to ask you that after you featured and I apologize. <laughs> oh, it, it's okay. Thank you so much for asking. And I actually did post out my, my, um, my website link on, on the chat and I'll do that again. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, you can find more information about my book and about my music in there. And uh, right now, um, uh, I, have a, I have a radio interview coming on Valley Views uh, this, this coming month in January, which I'm going to be posting on my IG. Valley Views is a, it's a radio station here in the San Fernando Valley uh, in Los Angeles County. And uh, they support uh, the artist community and, and, and uh, they support artists, uh, upcoming artists and entrepreneurs here in the community. So I'm going to be in there, um, so stay tuned. Uh, rather than that, uh, I'm also doing the, the poetry prompts, and, and that's been a lot of fun. That's been a, a definitely a, making me grow as a writer. Um, but yeah, I'll put my link in there. Thank you so much, uh, Kamari. You were you were awesome. Uh, you're you're you know like that. Um, the, how you can you compare like like your power to the desert? I mean that that was beautiful. I'm like wow, that's a poet. You know, like when you're able to see something like the desert, and you're able to like make. You know so much out of it um to see pretty much the, the life in there um uh, and, and and you know i just love it thank you so much <laughs> i was like wow mind blown um thank you <laughs> thank you juan and um i just want to echo too that uh if, if you'd like to sign up in the chat please um go ahead and type in solidarity and i will add you as as the list um starts going um i want to just thank all of the features who shared tonight um, I apologize that um, Eros J didn't make it, um, but hopefully next time we can uh, get him to come. Um, but I, I just want to thank Marcia and Micah and Juan and Kamari for uh, being so uh, willing to be present tonight with all of us and to all the people who have shared on the open mic. Um, it's just really amazing that we can be in this one space from all over the world and share our stories. And I really feel like that's how we build community and, and you know, um, foster the movements that we need for change. And poetry is such a, a, a tool for change, um, such an instrument that many of, you are, are, many of you are using to like share your experience and share what's going on with the world. So please keep writing and please stay connected. If you shared on the mic so far, please uh, let us know how to stay uh, in touch with you. Um, uh, especially uh, if you haven't put your contacts in the chat, uh, we'd love to stay connected. That's what this is all about. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the open mic. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's typed it in yet, but if you want to share, um, let me know if you want to just say solidarity or, hey, I'd like to share. Um, and that way I can add you to the mic. Um, and we'll give folks a minute to kind of chime in. Um, and if you're okay with, uh, with it, I'll go ahead and uh, share a piece while I'm waiting for other folks, folks to sign up. And this is just one that I've been reading a lot lately, but I wrote back in October. Um, and I don't know, I just feel like I really want to, to maybe have this grow a little bit. So first time sharing it um, with One Mic, One Globe. I don't usually share because I really want to highlight everybody's work here. and. Um, so please, if you want to get back on the mic, you know, we got this going until uh, 9.30 tonight. So um, this piece is not titled. Um, so here we go. What if we could grow wings, but the only way was with the deepest love, and the only way was sincerity, and the only way was together? What if we could all fly? But the only way was together, and the only way was truth, and the only way was the deepest love. And what if we could be free, all of us, but the only way was lasting change, and the only way was the deepest unshakable love. 
and the only way was together. Would you fly with me? Thank you. So I see some folks have signed up. Thanks for holding space for my piece. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Eric Devon uh, to sign up, who signed up first, and then Jessica, you can share after. So Eric, please come to the mic. Feeling like I'm being a little greedy. Um, yeah. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my daughter's on my mind a lot, especially today. And I have a sustainer that I wrote. Almost father reflects on conflict and cost. And there's a epigraph from um, Don Lundy Martin. It says, what is perpetually almost spilling off its imagined page. Um, when I read my sustain, I, I like to just mention what the six words that we'll repeat are. Um, they are trans, flames, become, wars, soft, and child. If our prayers are made Pentecost in other tongues and trance, and you listen just long enough to interpret the leaping flames as foolish, then forgive the stammering lip I doubtless become when I cannot pass over for you, when I have yet my own wars to back black and matter, when even woman is a season worn soft, but still thorny bramble wrapped around a father's child. And when is he not a holy day or an upper room for his child? How reverent he is when sorting her sacred tears ever transfixed on sippy cup and plastic scepter spoon, held high and soft, early hands bold too soon, do not douse the blooming flame she wills, her heritage hefted overhead. A fist shaken at wars until her voice, a rising leveled against the slow unbecoming of country. And if not father, who will disallow her to be comely for black. Allow, teach her how best to be divergence, a split child, a battleground having seen both blood, lust, and breath of war end with the familiar failed trudge from each exit to entrance. No lesser welcome when covered in ash, the ghost of flames sifted from air to settle on couch cushions, a brown doll soft eyelashes blinking away dust. Some men are not meant a soft end, would rather smith, pray for smelting and mercy, become iron again, a sharpened point. Home is a foundry where flames perform their purging violence until a blade where child once stood, wielded in all directions at once. A pair, newly transposed. The girl, dull spirited. A man, impotent armor, unwarranted. Whose voice etches a frown on faces pocked with warring. Is whittled down to mulch and brittle shavings scattered soft on earth long frosted over. No spring, nor bloom, recalcitrance. A shadow of revolution, the way an obstinate princess becomes her daddy's melting, leaked from a quiet rebellion. The child spreads light, pink and eager to spark again her flame, her joy, his pulse. Both pound swollen, painful red and inflamed, young unwitting soldiers are always first to fall in a season of war like ours. We trade shot for brutal volley above her head. A childhood begun as meager meal. A once family makes no feast of soft ears and passing patience. No effort to interpret tongues become Pentecost. Instead, our prayers are lost 
each to our own trance. Daughter, do not be entranced by indelicate flickering flames. The scent of singed flesh becomes pleasant to those who love war and wood that you seed your soft. There are battles yet to win, child. Thank you. Thank you so much. Eric Yvonne, um, you've blessed us with three poems tonight and I'd love to, for us all to stay in, in community with you. So please let us know how to, how to follow you or follow your work. Um, I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. Um, I don't know, I'd be around. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm on Instagram um, as True the Poetic, T-R-U-E, the Poetic. Um, Facebook, Eric Devon. Yeah. And then also I am um, working at Innate Divinity. Amazing. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight and sharing again on the mic. I'm going to go ahead and invite our next open mic share, uh, which will be uh, Jessica and Wilson uh, Cardenas. And then after, we will have Mr. Tzozomok um, to share. Uh, thank you again, Eric. And Jessica, you're up, uh, you're on deck. I think you might be muted though. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I was hearing a direction out there from somebody and I was like, what do you want me to do? So sorry. Um, again, what a beautiful mic and um, thank you so much. And um, wow, I love hearing Micah and Kamari and Eric and just everyone and Alex, your poem was amazing and beautiful. Uh, Micah, the IE, oh my God, it's awesome to meet someone from there. It's like a lot of times we're like, oh, we're, you know, LA. <laughs> but um, yeah, I know where you're, I know exactly that. It's so cool. Like Rancho and, and, and Valley Boulevard and Pepper Street and all that. I totally know. Uh, Colte, yeah. But anyway, um, and Kamari, you really did inspire. You inspired me after like everything quarantine in March, everything was canceled, the whole, LA Poet Society world crumbled. I felt crumbled. And after I saw you online doing a chat on IG, and I'm like, oh, you like, just to see you do that, take action and just be yourself. Like you totally inspired me. Like, and here we are with so many amazing programs and um, branched out with more hosts. And I mean, just thank you. I really, I love you. I admire you. And I love all the energy you have with the, the the world stage and CLI and um just what an amazing um you know service you're providing and CLI I mean all the world all, the, all out of the world stage and world stage press and everything you know just that you're you're up upholding so many poets in Los Angeles and I just love I love seeing that happen and um, lots of love for you sis and uh, anyhow I want to share one poem uh, gosh I've been chatting I, I want to just dedicate this poem to this fellow here. Um, uh, this is Justin Adler. Um, and anyway, just there he is. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, or is it sharing it? I think it's sharing it. Oh yeah, it is sharing it. And a long time ago, we were engaged and uh, then we weren't. But here is the poem that uh, is inspired by an experience with uh, him. And it's called Healing Oils, or no, Transported Oil. Angel in a psychic boutique. That's how he introduced her to me, Angelina, an angel. Didn't know why she was stuck with an aggressive man. She was charm and essence of kindness that was large enough to clean over his bad ego. She was curvy, hips that would cover the doorway and a smile you could climb on, reaching up into her eyes. She sparkled away the darkness. She gave me hope. She made candles, read fortunes, turned tarot and called in with tips what to avoid 
avoid today, who to avoid, beware, watch out, guard up. She was beautiful and I believed in her, her power to change the pain in my heart. Okay, Angelina, all I can think of is my scar, the Angelina that took away the light in my nine-year-old eyes, creeping up on decades later and still no resolve an empty relationship for mother, for father. How do I let it go? How can I numb my heart, heal, seek peace? My parents didn't talk to me. I love my dad. Didn't want to let him go. Didn't want to pay. Didn't want to continue a life hidden away. So when I spoke to the angel in a psychic boutique, I sought repair. I want daddy back. You have to go through your mother and he will follow. What? Her? Why? She never said anything, never fought for anything. Definitely not me. Yes, Angelina said. Her eyes are dark. You need to melt her and your father will follow her lead. It's the way to bring your father back into your life. I can make you a special candle. Oh, a special candle. Well, that sounded special. Just for me? Would that be the way? A spell to cast, to chant, to pray, to change everything? Disgusted I was that my happiness was tied to my mother. I didn't care if our relationship was in the cracks. It always was. But dad, Daddy, my daddy-o, surely I was enough to wake his heart. But it hadn't worked thus far. So Angelina, beautiful eyes, honey curls with red ink, ornamented face. I trusted her. She also spoke to Justin, her friend, her comrade, my guide in meeting the angel in a psychic boutique. He worked with her arrogant man, a computing guy, always smoking, always ranting, cursing his eyes, fighting his tongue, flinging his tongue at his angel. I don't know why she stayed. Pico and Robertson, an area unfamiliar, only a bunch of dollar bills posted to the windows. You gotta have money to come in here. Justin stayed silent, focused on his angel, smiled, uncertain, smiling, frowning. He turned around, found me on a lobby room chair. Let's go. Are we all done? I smiled, wanted to again hug Angelina. I trusted her, felt like I was going to be wrapped in my father's arms again. Felt I had hope. I had hope in her candle. It was gonna be made just for me, from me, my energy, my charm, my light. It will bring dad back to me, bring us together again. And the pain of this isolation and the chipping away of my heart and the bonds that held us together. Justin had three vials in his hands. What's that? My recipe. What? It's my recipe. Angelina made it just for me. She says it will help me ward off all the negative negativity and bad spells. I just put it on my pressure points. Oh, it's for protection. Yes, it is. I smelt it. I couldn't place it. It was an airy aroma that drifted sweetly into my brain. My mouth sat under the roof of my mouth. I felt uplifted. I felt purified. It was as if a quartz stone were melted down and poured onto my skin. Can I use some? I asked. He nodded. I was captivated by these thin tubes, glistening magic held inside. Opening a tube released the wings of butterflies, vibrant and wild, flowing gently into my nose. I was spellbound, hazed, fingers dancing over the oil that sat on the rim of the vial, splashing the sweets over my face, the trail of a 
rose garden swept by my nose, my brain smiles inside, shrinking and growing in joy, shrinking and erecting in a newness and acceptance that this blossom would save our hearts, protect our bodies, our energies from deep spells, immature concerns of negativity, feelings of inadequacy, nature in the distaste of tearing some down. This oil blocked all others because it was magical, because it was Angelina and I trusted her. I paid her $60 for the candle and left on the dream of heartful harmony for my family, for myself, for Justin, and all the bad seeds that fell around our feet would just remain on the floor and not cling to us. This magical lubricant that ran over my fingers bled deeper inside the grooves of my thumbs, deep in prints of fleshy identifiers, raw, abused, now blessed by oils, staining through my skin, soon able to be soaked into my veins. Deep bubbles will blossom outward and pop into the air around me. Rose, lavender, sweet and tender, a cool icing that sent chills of knowing the unknown, knowing what can't be held, what can't be said, an ice cube under my shirt that smoothed my back just right, the scent of freeness, new shalom, peace on your own tongue, peace of your inward self, that's the fume that shone above all, gently rising skyward, pulling my breasts, patting the angles of my face. Thank you for welcoming me, Angel in a psychic boutique. Thank you for empowering me with the empathy inside myself, helping my third eye see inward, blessed by your oil, your magical hands. Later, Justin would spill the vials. Two out of three saw the inside of his jean pocket, soaking his underclothes. How could you do that? I said. Such a precious and powerful concoction, not to be named, touched, understood, but I felt it. He needed the protection but fate folds for us at it as it is meant to. That smell, that airy smell of blossom spells tucked under my eyelids. I would only see it again in my dreams or in the faintest of memory as I lay here in mourning. 10 years passing since Justin took his own life months after our visit to the angel, much after the advice that sealed his lips, moons after the last time I touched her, felt her calm glow, her spirit and unconditional being that held you inside the cool halls of her essence, a body that would surround mine in its innocence or reality, a knowing of true love, power, and how it could withstand even the most toxic energy that could overcome. The oil will always be yours, Justin. The protection that now guards my life and the knowing that in the right breeze and the delicate drape of life, a blossom will invade my nose climbing further inside my brain and turn on the memories of you, curled up, twisted eyes, saddened heart, sometimes a validation that I am on the right path or the premonition that you are there and might have always been the delicate oil that would etch your skin, drawing you in and drawing you out. 
essence of Justin on tap, made by an angel in a psychic boutique. Thank you, Jessica, for taking us on that journey. Um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, share the mic with Mr. Tezosamok and then uh, Daniel K. And if anybody else wants to sign up, please uh, go ahead and just let me know in the chat box. Um, I'm happy to hear more poetry tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and share the mic with uh, Mr. Tezosamok for another piece. Thank you. All right, so I, I was listening to Juan's uh, share and I, I wanted to piggyback off of his coyote story. So mine is titled uh, Coyote Runs. Coyote lost his run. His opponents achieved victory, fatally puncturing his movement, a repudiation so complete leaving him no choice but to slink off into the sagebrush. Coyote dominated the conversation about both the present and the future, his outlandish claims that he won the election, except for the council's fraud. Those who despise Coyote, it seems clear the work goes on, the cause endures, the fear still lives and the nightmare shall never die. The grandmother said, except it will die most likely fast and with force, more than it looks possible today. The rest of the animals remained skeptical and worried, rightly so. Some of the old ones said, Coyote doesn't have another act in the forest politics. The, the worry that Coyote will remain uh, relevant hinges on the possibility that he's a unique historical figure. Coyote is singular in one sense only, no animal of his stripe could achieve what he did. In multiple other ways, he's just like any other forest animal. Coyote possessed a flamboyant, self-dramatizing persona. He tapped into genuine popular grievance towards elites, had ascendant moments which caused the other animals to quake and be intimidated. The grandmothers have often said that the forest is vulnerable to to the cult of personality and it's very common, but these afflictions never live long. And Coyote's recent escapade was no exception. The grandmother said, Coyote's not well positioned to retain his hold on the animals in the forest. He largely abandoned any pretense that he thinks about anything other than his personal resentments or that he's trying to harness his movement to big ideas that will improve the lives of the rest of the animals in the forest. When Coyote vaulted into the scene, is still putting gifts for channeling anger, for mockery, for conspiracy theory, or once channeled to an agenda that elders in the power had neglected the animals over trade, immigration, globalization, and perceptions of the forest decline. The grandmother said that the future never stands still, but Coyote's tricks largely remain the same. As Coyote scurries into the margins of the forest, he will be haunted by this stark reality. He was able to self-calibrate, he'd still be running the forest, but he never could. The grandmother said that Coyote had one set of political two of them. Things are going well, Coyote instinct is to double down on those. When things are going bad, Coyote doubles down. And when things went bad for Coyote, he needed to modulate his blame casting and brand of politics, Coyote would have been rewarded lavishly by the animals in the forest. Coyote didn't change because he didn't need to or couldn't conceive of how to do so. As the grandmother said, Coyote's combination of flawed judgment and impoverished imagination hardly supports optimism about Coyote's ability to retain power under real trouble circumstances. The forest original instructions declare that time moves on. Animals who wish to regain control don't have to confront or defeat coyote. They merely need to transcend coyote, using issues to create leadership personas that will make coyote look irrelevant, an artifact of an era that passed. But a sheeple yelled from the crowd and the council of grandmothers perked their ears. What about all the animals that follow and enable coyote? The oldest grandma from the turtle clan stood and addressed the animals 
and stated, it is true that Coyote will not lack ways to get his tricks out, but what will be his message? He yeah, had repeating claims of a stolen election that his lawyer, the toad, has said are not true. Conspiracy theories, of course, can have power, even without facts. That is how deep Coyote's trickery has to be. The forest fascination with strong animals who burst onto the scene with noisy opposition to the status quo will always have an appeal. But the grandmothers say that it is the animal's imagination that self-invent outsides outsiders who don't have staying power. The coyote years were just a peyote delusion, but they will soon come to feel like it. The hangover and constipation will not leave much opportunity for coyotes return to real power. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing again. And I, I always feel like they're uh, the way, the angle that you approach politics and just fosters so much reflection and um, thank you for writing about the now, you know, and also um, sharing again tonight. Um, I would like to go ahead and uh, invite our next open mic share and this will be Daniel K. Um, so welcome to the mic. Woo! All right, thank you very much. And I have to thank my good friend Kamari for uh, for the opportunity here. <clears throat> I don't have a poem for you guys, but I learned how to play uh, Joy to the World recently, and I played it for our church today in Spanish. So I'll play a verse for you guys in English and then a verse in Spanish, and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy that. So thanks, Kamari. <laughs> <laughs> A ver, un momento. Let me pull it up here. My uncle, my uncle Jim can play any song you want. I'm still kind of learning. <clears throat> While he's getting set up, I just want to say thank him for being flexible. <laughs> say that again. Thank you for being flexible. Oh, yeah. And thanks All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much. I can't hear you, but if you can hear me, we're good. All right, I see thumbs up. <laughs> Should be good enough. Christmas to you all. Gracias, mi amigo. I love it. <laughs> that was really sweet. And uh, thank you for sharing your joy with your guitar and, and with us. Um, I'd like to go ahead and invite our next 
poet um, who will be our final, I think, poet for the mic. If anybody else wants one last poem they want to share, they got to get out, let me know. Uh, type in solidarity. But I'd like to invite uh, Crystal Ray once more to the mic. And um, I Woo! appreciate you for joining us again. And go ahead, take it away. That's my good friend, too. We went to college together. That's Crystal. So I know Daniel and Crystal. You know, just wanted to say, okay, bye. Thank you, Kamari, for spreading the word. And I'm, it's been so great to hear new folks on the mic that I hadn't heard yet before. So uh, yeah, thank you, Kamari. Crystal, go ahead and uh, you're up next. And uh, you're, uh, Crystal, you're muted, apologies. It would have to be me. All right, thanks. Here we go, one more time. Um, I love much the myth of the phoenix and have thought oft to have her stapled to my back with needle and ink by a bearded gentleman in a semi-swept parlor whose own arm has a gloriously endowed coconut wearing indigenous woman shimmying with every small flex of his biceps. But I have no love for permanence or pain or pesky diseases that I imagine holiday in such places. I will just simply have to live her, be her, the Phoenix. Fearlessly willing to die and start again and die and start again. That I suppose really must do. Amazing. Thank you so much, Crystal Ray. And I love that, that feeling of just being it. You know, I appreciate you for bringing that into, into that poem and, and sharing that with us. And I wanted to kind of piggyback on that and just say that tonight we've, we've been something that hasn't existed. Um, when we come to Mike's and we share our poetry and our song and our presence together, we are being something new, uh, something that hasn't existed yet, but something that I think we're all dreaming about um, and hoping for. So I really appreciate that you all came to this mic tonight. Um, I really appreciate our features. Uh, and a shout out again to Marcia, uh, to Micah, to Juan, and uh, to Kamari, and to the Los Angeles Poets Society. Um, again, we started this last April, a monthly series, and uh, you know, it's growing. There's a lot going on with Los Angeles Poets Society. Feel free to stay connected with us at uh, lapoetsociety.org. There's a GoFundMe happening. Uh, you can buy t-shirts. There's so many ways to support and keep this going. Um, and I think more than ever, 2020 has showed us how much we need community and togetherness. So I am so grateful and humbled to be uh, sharing this mic with you tonight. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to close the night out with just one last breath together. Um, we shared a lot, uh, a lot of things that maybe, you know, stirred some things within us. Um, hopefully, you know, you have felt that the power of these words, the power that poetry is for healing and the way that community is here to hold you and your words um and your stories so thank you again for being here and if we could all just take all this energy we created and and hold it for a moment with our breath let's go ahead and uh, just close our eyes and take a deep inhale through the nose hold all this community all this heart all this truth all this might and exhale let it root let it root inside you as you exhale Let's do that again a couple more times. Deep inhale. Hold all this amazing love force that we have created. And exhale. Keep it, keep it within you. Keep it grounded with you. And one last time, just a deep inhale. And just holding in gratitude right now. I appreciate each of you and the way your words radiate for lasting change together and exhale. Once again, I'm Alex Petunia. Uh, you can follow me at The Poetic Petunia. 
I am a part of the Los Angeles Poets Society, and I am so glad we could be in community together. So uh, that's it for now. I'll hang back if anybody has questions or wants to chat. But again, thank you so much for your time and energy and uh, fearless words. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed night. Thank you, Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Los Angeles Poets Society. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye. So I will go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you all for being here and sharing yourselves with us tonight. Thank you.